On this day, being my 30th birthday, I've decided to continue my new Artist Reboot series. But this time, instead of taking forgotten and ridiculous Marvel characters and updating their designs and rewriting their stories into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I've decided to take some of the awesome, ridiculous Batman villain suggestions people have given me in previous comment sections and rewrite and redesign them as if they were part of a new set of Suicide Squad comics. I am also totally open to doing a broader DC villains episode like this, using characters like Dog Welder that people have suggested. So leave me more ridiculous forgotten DC villain suggestions in the comments, and subscribe if you're new here and you want to encourage this series to continue and broaden out even more into things like forgotten Godzilla monsters rebooted into the MonsterVerse. And besides that, sit back and enjoy today's story and artwork. Let's go. Hit like, if you want. Subscribe, if you feel like. But either way, enjoy the show. As usual, I'll start with context for each of the characters before I get into their new stories. So first we have the Condiment King, who has a pretty simple origin. He was created for Batman the Animated Series in the 90s, and was a famous stand-up comedian by the name of Buddy Standler that had ticked off the Joker. Joker then kidnapped and brainwashed him into becoming a really goofy supervillain who uses ketchup and mustard guns to try and stick up a fancy restaurant, before quickly getting taken down by Batman. In the original iteration, his guns shoot like squirt guns, but my version is gonna be a little bit more dangerous, and I've changed up his origin story to give him a bit more agency. But first, the setup. Amanda Waller's Task Force X, a covert team made up of criminals doing her dirty work to reduce their prison sentences in Belle Reve, has been through many, many members. You don't get the nickname the Suicide Squad for being a team that never loses its assets, and often Waller will know in advance which missions are likely to make her task force drop like flies. On occasions, she'll even send a team of lesser villains as a trial run, assuming that they'll be killed to see how dangerous a situation is for her real squad to make their move. Buddy Standler, aka the Condiment King, has been sent on these sorts of suicide missions multiple times, and exceeding Waller's expectations, has actually survived every single one. Before ending up in Belle Reve, Buddy had been a struggling stand-up comedian by night who ran a hot dog stand in Gotham's financial district by day. For quite some time, his life had been a frustrating one, as he'd constantly fail to draw crowds at his shows and be performing to three or four people at most, then be disrespected at his day job by a group of young hotshot traders from the Gotham National Bank, who thought it was funny to rag on Buddy for his job and his constantly red and yellow stained shirt. Earning the amount he did, he couldn't afford to be constantly be washing his clothing, and it infuriated him that these thugs who earned 50 times what he made in a year couldn't show a little compassion for his position. One day, they even took his ketchup and mustard bottles and sprayed him with them, taunting him and even squirting a ring of mustard on his head, calling him the Condiment King. And that day was the last straw. These guys came to his work every day to embarrass him, so he decided to do the same to them. But being a little bit more drastic, he made himself a goofy outfit and rigged up two high-powered pressure washers connected to his back, one full to the brim with ketchup, and the other with mustard, both thinned out with some water so that they'd spray properly. The next day, he hid the getup in his hot dog cart and rolled into the Gotham National Bank, stating to security that he'd been paid to bring dogs in for the guys on the trading floor. With some convincing, he was let in and on the elevator ride up, he changed into his new outfit, including a set of goggles that somewhat obscured his appearance. He then marched onto the trading floor and quickly started getting people laughing and snickering in confusion at who he was. But that was fine, all part of the plan. He spotted the thugs who always made fun of him and marched up to them. They started laughing as well and asked who he was supposed to be. And he said, what, you don't recognize me? He squeezed the triggers on both pressure washers and shot ketchup and mustard at such high speeds that they carved right through his target's flesh, practically chopping his arms off as he said, I'm the freaking condiment king. At first, the ketchup obscured the blood, but when the man started screaming and Buddy took aim at the other bullies, the floor went into a panic and started running from the building. After severely injuring all the guys who taunted him, Buddy fled and went into hiding, knowing he'd have the cops coming after him soon. But on top of getting revenge, he found an added benefit to what he'd just done. Security footage of his act was going viral, and everyone in the city was talking about him and wanted to know more about him. 
Some extremists were even praising him as some kind of symbol, taunting and sticking it to the big banks. It hadn't been his intent, but having people finally paying so much attention to him, as he'd been seeking so long from his stand-up career, he realized he couldn't hang up this new, unusual mantle just yet. He donned the costume of the Condiment King again and went after another bank, this time sticking it up trying to steal the money, claiming to be the symbol that he thought his adoring public wanted him to be. Of course, with nothing but a couple of pressure washers and no combat training, when Batman showed up on the scene, the fight didn't last very long. But even still, Buddy would hear afterwards that there were those that wished Batman had just let the man be, and he continued to get even more praise from other criminals when he was behind bars for aggravated assault and attempted armed robbery. He'd be in prison for five years, then get out on good behavior, having spent his whole time in prison bulking up then immediately make a new version of his outfit and go to seek more praise and glory again. Of course, he seriously underestimated the bat, as becoming muscular doesn't mean you can actually hold your own in a fight. He was put away again, but this time in a prison more used to locking away criminals of his kind. Belle Reeve. And so began his time on the Suicide Squad. Here is context for King Tut. He was a villain created for the 1960s Batman TV series with Adam West, which was known for being very campy and goofy. The character's real name was William Omaha McElroy, and he was an Egyptology professor at Yale University who got hit in the head with a rock, passed out, and woke up believing he was the pharaoh of ancient Egypt, Tutankhamun often referred to just as King Tut. Believing it to be his domain to rule, he tries to take over Gotham City. My version is going to be similar, but go a bit darker route, and I'm going to give him more abilities, with some help from another infamous Batman villain, who's actually been around even longer than the Joker, Hugo Strange. Here's the story. For all members of the Suicide Squad, Amanda Waller will have an explosive implanted in the base of their necks. If they don't obey her orders, they know they risk having it detonated. Often that will be enough incentive to play nice, but some members need to be coaxed in different ways. For a man named William Omaha McElroy, Waller had to convince him that doing what she says is to do the will of the gods of ancient Egypt. You see, McElroy was once a prolific professor of Egyptology with an encyclopedic knowledge of the life of King Tutankhamun, who took the throne of ancient Egypt before he was even 10 years old. Unfortunately, this information would be part of his undoing. He'd always been an easily stressed man with fluctuating mental health issues and, in a very short succession, went through a series of traumatic events that would push him over the edge. His wife and son were killed in an attack on Gotham perpetuated by the Riddler, his home was burned to the ground, and he severely injured his left leg, impairing his movement for a few months. All this has since been attributed to the mental breakdown he then had, which caused him to believe that he was King Tutankhamun reincarnated, given another chance to rule by the gods. He spent a few days in robes out in the streets of Gotham ranting at people to obey him, and when he was approached by the police, he attempted to take one of their guns, leading to them arresting him. His crimes shouldn't have been big enough to have him put away in Arkham, but the lead psychiatrist there had learned of this man and saw an opportunity for an experiment, so he pulled some strings. Hugo Strange had a fascination with the criminally insane and with the vigilantes of Gotham, especially Batman. He used his position as the head of Arkham to run all manner of cruel and unusual experiments on the patients there, merely for the interest of seeing how they'd respond and often how Batman or Gotham as a whole would respond to the subject's actions if they happened to escape his facility. When McElroy was brought in, Strange spent a few days interviewing the man, learning how deep his psychosis ran, and was near giddy to learn that because McElroy had such a thorough knowledge of King Tut's life, it had been very easy for him to convince himself that he was the Pharaoh. And now Strange wanted to take things a little farther. He'd acquired an artifact called the Orb of Ra, an item known for having magical powers that had once turned the archaeologist Rex Mason into the superhero Metamorpho. 
He presented the artifact to McElroy, stating that Strange had been instructed by the god of the sun and of order, Ra himself, to grant the orb to McElroy and aid him in his rule. Strange stated that the orb could help ensure that his might was recognized and that health problems could not be his undoing again as they had been in his prior life. McElroy took the orb and, while well, it had given Rex Mason elemental abilities, it had a different effect in the hands of a man believing himself to be Pharaoh. It made his body far stronger and healthier. He could also manifest balls of blinding light and channel the power of the sun to create spontaneous eruptions of flames. He used this to flee from Arkham and go back to Gotham where he used the orb to fly to the top of the tallest building in the city, Wayne Tower, and announced to all that he had returned and was their now and future king. After briefly trying to coax him down, he was fired upon by the GCPD, and in return he scorched them with plumes of flames from his orb. This of course was more than enough to bring the Bat family after him, and as they're always eventually able to do, they bested McElroy and took the orb from him. They restrained the sick man to be incarcerated again, but Strange had already gotten exactly what he wanted. He observed the aftermath with glee as arguments in competing Gotham news stations broke out over whether the man had been the reincarnated Tutankhamun or just a madman who'd acquired a dangerous weapon. Strange fanned the flames by stating that McElroy had spontaneously summoned the Orb of Raw while in a psychiatric session, and, of course, Strange had ensured to erase all evidence of him having acquired the artifact himself. Many believed him, but Batman, of course, didn't buy the story. He kept the orb himself safe in the Batcave, and ensured that McElroy was not sent back to Arkham. Unfortunately, now that he had a physically enhanced body and some remaining ability to spawn bursts of light and flames, even without the orb in his hands, he caught the attention of another prison warden, and soon was locked up in Belle Reve, ready to head out with Task Force X. Quick interruption to say that if you want to do me a little bit of a 30th birthday present, and do yourself a bit of a favor, consider going to check out a video from Kingpin Creations. Kyle over there has got another story and speed paint style channel going that's very close to hitting a thousand subscribers, may have even hit it by the time this video comes out, but if not, let's see if we can help him get past that threshold. I'll link one of his videos, subscribe if you like what you see from him, and maybe watch a few things that he's got. I mean, you know, open it in a new tab so you can finish watching this first, but still, Kingpin Creations, go check him out. Linked in the description, but for now, back into more goofy Batman stuff. Let's go! Here's context for the Eraser, who I genuinely think, besides his goofy look, is a fantastic idea for a Batman villain. Lenny Fiasco, first of all, who has an incredible name, hires himself out to other criminals about to take on big heists, and for 20% of the cut will meticulously erase all evidence of them from the crime scene when they're finished, leaving nothing traceable for a Batman or the police to use to track them down. But he's considered to be a pretty ridiculous Batman villain because he dresses as a giant pencil with pointy lead shoes that he uses to stab people. He was also actually a classmate of Bruce Wayne's who is made fun of for always making mistakes and constantly using his eraser. I honestly think Amanda Waller would love to have a guy like this on the Suicide Squad. So here's his new story. Waller's covert team of criminals is meant to be just that. Covert. If the public learned of what she was doing with these criminally insane and dangerous people, there would likely be immediate calls for her job, and maybe even her head. The problem is, even when forced to follow orders, her criminal lackeys aren't always the most subtle in what they do, leaving ample evidence of their actions behind. It wouldn't take the world's greatest detective to see a high-tech boomerang left at the scene of an incident and figure out that Captain Boomerang had been involved despite the fact that he was supposed to be locked up in Belle Reve. This is why a favorite member of Waller's to send in at the end of a job is Lenny Fiasco, aka the Eraser. Lenny was one of many squad members coming from Gotham City. As a boy there, while well, he hadn't been officially diagnosed, Lenny had developed obsessive compulsive disorder, likely because he'd had to survive in the home he'd grown up in. His parents were both highly irresponsible slobs who'd leave food cooking so long it'd catch fire, leave spills on the ragged wooden floor to start rotting and mold development, and would constantly forget to pay the bills. Barely into his teenage years, he began doing all of the cooking and cleaning, and even learned enough to do his parents' accounting and taxes for them. 
While it was obviously very helpful for them, living this way was torturous for Lenny, and his mind would obsessively be on the lookout for anything that his parents, or people he interacted with, might be doing that could cause them harm. He'd try to tell everyone around him, even people he didn't know, how to dress not to get sick, what to eat to stay healthy, not to walk while distracted on their phone. Any potentially dangerous act he saw others committing would trigger him and compel him to try and tell them what to do. Which, as you might imagine, even though he had good intentions, really irritated a lot of people and made him off-putting to them, meaning it had been very difficult for Lenny to ever get a job or make any friends. That is, until he was embraced by a rather unexpected community. During Christmas break near the end of his time in university, Lenny came home to his parents' place only to find that his father had become a small-time criminal to help make ends meet. He forced Lenny to come and be a lookout as he and some other guys broke into the Gotham Museum. He stood outside the back door, quaking at how uncomfortable he was, constantly looking inside to see how his father and the small crew he was with were doing. By the time they were headed out the door, Lenny was horrified to see how much evidence of their actions they were leaving behind. As they tried to get him to flee, he listed how they'd left footprints that the police could use to get their shoe sizes and know how many of them there were, fingerprints had been left by one man who'd taken off his gloves to handle a more delicate object, they'd disconnected three security cameras but hadn't seen a fourth one in the far corner of the room, he went on and on and soon just ran in and cleaned up all the evidence they'd left himself before finally fleeing the scene with them. Lenny's dad thought the boy was just being paranoid, but another member of the group, a career criminal from the Falcone crime family, was impressed. He offered Lenny a job doing basically what he'd just done on that crime scene, coming with his guys on jobs and watching for their mistakes. The idea of living a criminal life terrified Lenny at first, but when he met some of the other Falcones, he was astounded by how warmly they embraced him. Where other people avoided him and made fun of him for his overly meticulous nature, the Falcones praised him for it. Not to mention they were willing to pay him very, very well, once they saw how good he truly was. They even gave him the nickname The Eraser, and decked him out in some flashy supervillain-like attire. He'd never wanted to be a criminal, and was somewhat ashamed to be one, but feeling so accepted was something he'd never experienced, and he was afraid he'd never find it anywhere else if he left. That is, until he was eventually forced to leave this group behind. If you commit enough crimes, or at least aid in them long enough in Gotham, you're eventually going to get taken down by the Bat, and not even Lenny's eye for errors was as refined as Batman's. When a wide sect of the Falcones were taken down, the Eraser was taken down with them. After seeing how dirty prisons were and how awful the food was, Lenny quickly started using his eye for error, watching the guards, to attempt escapes. After a few nearly successful shots at it, he was transferred to a more secure prison, Belle Reve, where his Task Force X career began. Eventually, Lenny had done so many jobs for Waller that he'd completely erased his prison sentence, but instead of going back to the Falcones, he'd noticed that he'd felt embraced by Amanda Waller's own team, as he wasn't like the unpleasant criminals that they often had to work with. And so he decided to stay and became fully and properly employed by Waller, working with her team behind the scenes to keep track of all the mistakes or evidence the squad left in their wake. When Waller realized what an asset he could be, she even got him proper psychiatric help to ensure that he could both still use his meticulous nature to assist in cleanups while not having his OCD control his life and actions. Now, on the right side of the law, what depending on what you think of Amanda Waller, Lenny was able to find acceptance once again, but this time in a life that he felt he could truly be proud of. Now here's context for the rainbow creature, who I am admittedly going to take more creative liberties with. Originally, this creature showed up in the goofy Silver Age of comics as a beast that spawned out of a volcano in South America while Batman and Robin were there dealing with rebellions, because I guess they weren't busy enough with Gotham's issues. It has different abilities activated by different colors on it, but as it uses a specific ability, the color associated with that ability gets used up, and it then has to absorb more of that color, or a different color, from something in its environment. Even though it's a character from South America, I'm going to bring its origins a little bit farther north to the Caribbean for my version of it. Here we go. While Task Force X often employs lesser-known metahuman criminals, there are cases when villains of great notoriety are utilized. 
Amanda Waller has recently acquired a particularly well-known villain of Gotham after he returned to face Batman with an unusual but very dangerous enhancement. Bane had been born on the Caribbean island of Santa Prisca during a time of revolution and immense government corruption. He was forced to take on his escaped father's jail sentence from birth, meaning he was raised in the confines of Panadura prison. To survive there, he'd trained his body and mind to become a lethal force of nature, and was eventually, essentially, running the prison. He even agreed while in there to undergo experimentation to become even stronger using a steroid called Venom. It worked on him, unlike it had on everyone else who'd tried it, but Bane would need to take the drug every 12 hours to keep up his immense strength, or else he'd become sick and lose it all. And because of this, he'd spent much of his life on the lookout for an alternative. Far into his criminal career, long after he'd famously broken Batman's back in Gotham, Bane had escaped prison there and sought refuge back in Santa Prisca. Only to find the locals were telling tales of a strange creature, killing hikers up in the mountains. He ignored them at first, but as he heard more and more people stating this as more of a fact than a legend, he became curious. He hiked up to the area of the sightings himself and quickly found that the tales were true. A creature, even larger than his own massive stature, was there. It was an odd beast with an array of rainbow coloring and an array of abilities. It could project flames from its red flesh, ice from its blue, could vaporize what it touched with its yellow, and could strike with strength that rivaled Superman with its green leg. If he was hit from a blow from that, even someone as strong as Bane could have essentially been flattened. Luckily, he found that as the beast used these abilities, its colors would drain, and it would need to absorb more before using them again. It was unlike anything Bane had ever seen, and whether it was a supernatural entity or some sort of alien life form, he wanted to study it and see if he could harness any of its might for himself. He fought the creature, staying on defense while it drained its powers, then knocked it out while it sought more color to charge up. He brought it to a lab where he eventually found, by keeping it sedated and controlling its exposure to different colors, he could siphon the creature's multicolored blood to mix in with the very venom that gave him his own strength. After some trial and error, Bane found that he was able to control the exact same abilities as this creature, making his own flesh change colors. While it didn't change his need to take venom every 12 hours, he thought with these enhancements he may finally be able to permanently slay his rival back in Gotham and so he returned to go another round with the bat. As one might expect, unprepared for this new set of abilities, Batman was nearly killed on their first battle. But, after escaping and having some time to prepare, he was able to use a similar tactic on Bane that the brainy brawler had used on the creature, letting him wear out his colorful new skills till he was back to a state that Batman had managed to best before, and would once more. Not only would Bane then be taken to Belle Reve, but Waller would learn of where he had the creature sedated and have it brought to her as well. That way she'd have further leverage with Bane to get him to do her dirty work on the Suicide Squad. She'd grant him access to his colorful new Venom whenever he'd go on a mission for her. And while she would use him sparingly, knowing how intelligent and powerful Bane was, making an escape attempt from him much more likely to succeed than those of other inmates, when she needed a particularly heavy hitter, she knew exactly where to turn. If you enjoyed this, you might want to check out my Marvel equivalent videos. I've done two of them, rebooting old ridiculous Marvel characters like Armless Tiger Man, The Wall, Asbestos Lady, updating their designs and rewriting them into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Or, again, check out something from Kingpin Creations. Link to the description. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note. And the thought I want to leave people with today is the idea that I've heard lots of people talk when they get into their late 20s, early 30s, being like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm this old already. And I personally do not feel that way at all. My response to turning 30 has honestly been, I'm only 30? I feel like I've been around a lot longer than that. And I think a big part of the reason for that, on top of the fact that I exercise regularly and eat healthy, is that I have a job that I absolutely love. And that's not something that accidentally happened. A little over five years ago, I committed to building this channel. And well, the first year was a massive grind and was difficult and caused some mental health problems for me that I had to fix after the fact, it was worth every single second. And the only quote unquote bad things that happened were really just stress 
shining a spotlight on mental health issues that I already had, and forced me to learn how to overcome those things. So ultimately they weren't bad at all, they were really good for me in the long run. The point is to say whatever stage of life you're at now, however old you are, if there's some career or project that you've been wanting to work on, and you've been putting off, I highly recommend you get started on it as soon as possible. Especially if you can do it before other life responsibilities start piling up. Because once you have a career that you absolutely love, it won't fix all your other problems in life, but it does make everything else just a little bit easier. I think that's one of the main reasons I just don't feel very old. I hope that's inspiring. I love you all. Thank you so much for being along for this awesome ride, and I'm excited to see where this channel and this new series goes in the future.